Lecture 15, Rate Limits. Okay, so sometimes, as the saying goes, it's not me, it's you, uh, or, you know, as uh, George from Seinfeld would say, you know, if, if anybody, it's me. Um, so what I really mean with this is that sometimes like the limiting factor uh, in our application is something that maybe isn't under our control. Um, and this can be a frustrating situation, right? We like to think that uh, you know, our service is sort of the master of its own destiny or you know, our product is, uh, is going to be able to go as fast as we want. But like, if ever we integrate with a third party something, that's not necessarily the case, right? Um, there's, there's going to be some limitations that uh, other parties may impose on us that we might not have a lot of say in. Um, and um, when your application is running up against this problem, well, I mean, it can feel frustrating, right? Um, you know, speed limits uh, exist on roads, and speed limits may feel frustrating to you uh, if they are not uh, congruous with the design of the road, uh, which is a, a whole separate uh, discussion where you can you know, watch uh, endless hours of this sort of thing on YouTube, uh, learning about sort of what makes for a well-designed road versus a street and... Uh, you know, it's uh, it's an interesting topic if you're into this sort of thing, but uh, obviously it's not for everybody. Um, but a rate limit is, to a certain extent, exactly what it sounds like. You can think of it as a speed limit uh, for for a program, um, in in the sense that um, we are going to say it is a maximum rate at which a requester can make requests of a service, um, and. Um, how many requests can we submit in a given period of time? That's one possible way that we could define a rate limit, and that's actually a pretty good definition for us to work with for a lot of cases that we are interested in. If we make more requests than we are permitted uh, in the time frame that we are talking about, then those requests are rejected with something that says you're making requests too fast. Um, you, you get a response code of usually 429, uh, which is um, it's an HTTP code, uh, which is response uh, above limit. Uh, other services, I think at one point Twitter returned, uh, I think it was 420, um, and it, it was enhance your calm or something like that. Um, it's, it's kind of silly, um, but that's, that's what they chose. Right. Um, so this is the limit. If we are requesting things you know, more often than that or faster than that, uh, then those requests are rejected with a, a message saying you're trying to access this too fast. Please, please wait longer. Or please stop doing that. Now, rate limits can be more complicated than that, right? Um, it can be um, a very simple version of uh, requests per unit time, but it can also be uh, something that has multiple thresholds. So you can have A requests per hour for a maximum of B requests per day. It's not strictly speaking like a rate limit example, but um, sometimes you know, if you're visiting a foreign country, it's like, okay, you're allowed to visit for up to 90 days at a time uh, for no more than 180 days in a year, so, something like that, right? So, so that's a... Um, that's a multiple threshold kind of thing. You can visit that country um, in any one visit, uh, a fixed amount of time, up to 90 days, but also there's like a, a annual cap. Uh, and you can obviously exhaust that annual cap um, fairly quickly in the year um, if you were there for you know, two periods of 90 days that were almost back to back. Um, and that would be fine, right? Just don't exceed that because getting deported from the country is bad and uh, you're, you're not going to enjoy that process, uh, not, not even one little bit. Um, now, responses can be complicated as well under the circumstances, right? Um, but um, we could also look at more complex queries. Um, so maybe you're only allowed to change your user data um, a certain number of times per day, uh, and there's a, a maximum uh, of D requests uh, per, of any type per day in total. Um, we get lots of lots of choices about what we want to measure uh, and how we're going to um, identify sort of what falls in what bucket. The important thing, however, is that um, at some point um, requests are measured against some number, and if we exceed that number, uh, they're just rejected. 
Uh, we could talk about slowing down requests versus just outright rejecting them. Um, we could intentionally delay or deprioritize requests that exceed a threshold. That's cool and interesting, but beyond what we want to talk about here, um, just for time reasons, we'll focus on the much simpler case of rejecting requests that exceed the threshold. We could consider um, in, in the future uh, or in a, a longer discussion whether or not it makes sense to delay requests if we can. Um, but like I say, for for the purposes of today, we'll just talk about rejection. Um, and rejected requests can be a huge problem for your application or for your service. Um, an obvious example is if your app uses ChatGPT, you know, hey, summarize this request for me. Um, I, I dare not ask ChatGPT to summarize this lecture because uh, it might, might actually uh, come up with something very concise um, or maybe, uh, maybe not. But let's say that you're using ChatGPT in your app and you run up against a rate limit. Okay, well, what do you do? All right. Um, some aspect of your application is kind of not working right now, and it may in fact be the critical one, depending on you know, how heavily you rely uh, on you know, the ChatGPT uh, API to do the thing that you want to do. That might actually be a huge problem because like, well, our app is down now, or um, you know, some users are having a bad experience. Right, um, that's not that's not a great user experience that you don't and you don't want to do that. But again, sometimes um, this is what happens when you rely on some third party service. I have another fun example. Um, and this this one's a fun story to tell. It's from a payment processing platform, um, and um, we would get rate limited uh, by this payment processing platform because they would step one generate an invoice and notify us via a webhook. Um, and then our service would validate the webhook, just, just check the validity, not do anything with it, just, just make sure this was a legitimate request that actually came from the source um, so that we know whether or not uh, we should add it to the to-do list because obviously um, it's important to check that, um, that the webhook comes uh, from a valid source. It's like public key kind of encryption. Um, if, if it's not valid, we shouldn't take action on it because that wouldn't be the right thing to do. But we're just validating it. Uh, and then uh, our service in step three would get uh, rate limited by uh, the payment processing platform because we were uh, calling the uh, validation endpoint too quickly, uh, too often in a particular period of time. Now, wait a minute. I mean, they're just calling us and we're checking that uh, what we're receiving is valid. Yeah, well, their API doesn't care. HTTP 429, too many requests. Okay, so why do rate limits exist? Um, speed limits exist because they're the law, you know, safety and you know, courtesy to other drivers and, and all of that sort of plays a role. Um, although speed limits are also to some extent political because uh, your city council can you know, pass a law that lowers speed limits and so you know, that seems seems like a fairly common thing. Um, and you know, is it based on safety or design of the road or what have you? Probably not. It's just, you know, well, listen, you know, <laughs> city council has decided. But we actually want to talk about you know, rate limits for a computer program. Uh, and for this, they exist because every request has a certain cost associated with handling it. It takes work, however much or however little, to respond to a request. Uh, and that may not be measured directly in a currency. Um, if you are paying for CPU time from a cloud provider, then it, it is probably actually measured in like you know, an actual amount of uh, money where okay you know, this um, this AWS Lambda ran for this many milliseconds and each millisecond is associated with a certain price um, so you know responding to that request literally is measured in money for other things maybe not it can also be measured in opportunity cost if you are just like renting the system full time, you know, it's a container that's running and you're not really paying for CPU seconds or anything like that, every request that you are responding to is potentially delaying any other requests that come at the same time. Uh, and if the system is not very busy, uh, delay is, is pretty minimal as you, know, you handle requests, uh, many in parallel, maybe a little bit sequentially depending on what you want to do, that's fine. 
Um, but if the system is busy as work accumulates, right, we are continually sort of delaying work, you know, finding a time to process it, you know, it goes in the queue and we work on it when there's time. So each request is delaying other requests. Um, if some of those requests or um, you know, other uh, interactions are fraudulent or invalid or you know, just wasting your time for whatever reason, um, then it's taking away time and resources from other legitimate requests. Like your actual paying customers are, are being frustrated here because it's taking longer to get an answer uh, because you know, evil attackers are like trying to guess passwords um, by uh, spamming the login endpoint, something like that, right? Um, this is this is not good. Um, if your system is like very heavily over provisioned, i.e., there's much more capacity than you actually need, then these additional requests are slightly annoying, but they don't really cost very much. Um, but if you are trying to run things a little bit closer to the edge or the limit, uh, such that you are um, you know not uh, sitting around with lots of extra unneeded capacity, then these additional requests kind of Kind of hurt. Um, there's another example of uh, rate limits uh, contributed here by um, Professor Lamb, um, where uh, he's talking about um, getting rate limited on a government website. But we'll talk about sort of a um, denial of service attack, um, you know, bombardment first, if we if we may. Um, and denial of service attacks are a way that attackers can negatively impact the functioning of a service by simply sending in a large number of invalid requests. Uh, and a denial of service attack becomes a distributed denial of service attack when the attacker is sending in the request from numerous clients. Uh, making it distributed um, not only allows the attacker much more capacity to send in requests, but it also prevents sim simple solutions like blocking the IP. Uh, of the offending system. Given enough invalid requests, uh, it can um, overwhelm the service uh, that it's calling, uh, which may, um, may be uh, re rejecting valid uh, requests. Um, it could cause it to crash. Uh, it may exhaust resources like network handles in a Unix system. Um, or maybe it's just super slow to the point that it's frustrating or unusable from the point of view uh, of legitimate users. So we don't want that, right? Uh, and Professor Lamb's uh, analogy has to do uh, with uh, a system that allowed people who reside in the province of Ontario uh, to write letters to the Minister of Environment about allowing uh, rock climbing in provincial parks. As you may have seen from some uh, early slides in the course, uh, he's, he's just, uh, kind of into rock climbing, uh, and uh, I get it. It's it's fun. Uh, I haven't gone in a while, but uh, it's something that I've enjoyed myself. So I, I see it. Um, but uh, basically, you know, people were writing in to the uh, to the ministry, uh, sending emails, uh, and they were being encouraged to do so uh, at the rock climbing gym because that's where you're going to find people who share your interest uh, and would like this to happen. Uh, but the climbing gym IP address got rate limited um, because people were sending letters from the gym's Wi-Fi network and from the point of view of the receiving system, this appeared to be lots and lots of letters coming from the same place. Uh, and maybe that is you know, fraudulent, right? When people are writing in letters to these sorts of things, you would like to uh, at least a, a little bit limit the rate at which people can send them. So spammers who are angry at the you know, government over some policy uh, can't absolutely uh, flood the uh, receiving system uh, with uh, their boilerplate angry letter. Um, yeah, this. Uh, now, unfortunately, this story doesn't have uh, a happy ending as, as far as I know. Um, according to what I see, the, uh, the, there never was sort of a satisfactory resolution from the letter writing service. Um, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the notes uh, reference the idea that you know, Canadians tend to have lower uh, data limits than in, in many other countries, not, not just Americans. Uh, and therefore, sending from public Wi-Fi or you know, shared Wi-Fi is uh, is probably more common, uh, and the system maybe didn't uh, consider that context, um, or maybe, and I'm going out on a limb here, uh, maybe the provincial government doesn't care that much what we think. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm not accusing you know this government in particular of anything, but um, this seems to be pretty common across uh, levels of government. So, am I cynical? Sure. Um, is that new? No. 
Here's another thought about how requests consume resources, and we can consider a proposed and then later retracted approach that the Unity engine wanted to take uh, in the year 2023. Um, Unity makes a game engine that people use to make ostensibly fun games. Fun is subjective, but let's imagine that, that you want to that you want to uh, consider the games fun. Now, the licensing model for the engine didn't really take into account the live service kind of game. Think Fortnite, Diablo 4, or something like that, where the game itself is free to play. So there's no like upfront purchase price, but the company makes money, um, and it makes money through selling cosmetic items, power boosts, um, and or generally preying on people with gambling addictions via loot boxes, which are legally considered gambling in certain countries. Now. Unity doesn't get a cut of that in their contract because they didn't really foresee this and they wanted money because it takes money to make a game engine. So like, that's not a ridiculous thing. What they came up with the, as their solution is they wanted to charge per installation. Aha. See, the thing is, um, the internet is full of people who are very clever. Uh, and, you know, I, I understand um, that uh, any of these solutions that have any kind of vulnerability, people will just discover it in, in pretty short order. Um, it's, it's why when people say, um, you know, uh, when we're writing an exam in the pack, like, how come we can't have computers? And, you know, what if, what if we, like, issued university computers that have, you know, communication mechanisms disabled or something like that? And I, I always say it's, it's because you're smart. Like, you will as students collectively figure out a way to have these computers communicate uh, that somehow we didn't anticipate, even, even if it's just like, you know, there's like an infrared port on the side and if you angle your computer correctly, you can like beam information between them. And it's something like completely ingenious that we did not think of, right? So um, this sort of thing inevitably ends with people on the internet coming up with, um, with an exploit. Um, and in this one, the exploit was fairly easy to see, which is if it's charged per installation, and you know I'm mad at a certain company, which I, I may be for you know any number of reasons. Um, what if I just write a script that repeatedly installs and uninstalls the game, even if it's only one cent every single time? If enough people do this, and you do it for long enough, and you do it often enough, you could potentially bankrupt the company just by repeatedly uninstalling and uh, and uh, reinstalling this game. Uh, and you, know, you do it enough times, it is a major item on the balance sheet. So Unity walked it back and they said, well, they want it to be first install, but per device. And uh, I mean, people didn't write as many news articles about this part, but like, eh, this is also kind of solvable because like, how do you tell what device it is? Oh, well, maybe you look at like hardware and device IDs and something like that. But uh, these are things you could fake, right? Um, just lie to the application about hardware IDs or something, or randomize what the you know, GPU reports itself as every single time. So you could do a lot of damage with this um, because it is not a great plan. Suffice it to say, though, that game developers uh, using the engine revolted, and some of them decided they would like to switch to a different engine. Um, you know, friendship ended with Unity. Now Godot is, is my best friend. Um, yeah. So listen, if every request to your service is you know, somehow uh, costing you money, you got to find a way to control the cost. Sometimes, though, it's not even about costs. Um, rate limits can also prevent weird things like uh, people scraping all of your data. Um, this really happened in sort of early 2021 to the openly political social media site um, called Parler. Um, you would be also forgiven for thinking it's Parler, um, like it is in French. Um, but uh, apparently not. Uh, and my expectation is you may not be familiar with this site since realistically it was only popular amongst conservative Americans and mostly also in the year 2020 uh, before all the major internet companies refused to do business with them, basically putting them out of business. Um, so yeah, that, that turned out great for them. Um, in any case, um, they had two very bad decisions um, that came uh, came to bite them in this regard. One of them is it, that uh, it was trivially easy to identify all posts because posts always used sequential numbers. So uh, if you 
uh, looked at a post ID and you know just incremented that number by one, you would immediately get to the next post. You know, they weren't randomized, they weren't UUIDs, they weren't anything like that. Uh, it was just sequential numbers, so super easy to write a script that iterates over all of those and downloads them because there's no rate limits. Right? A single person uh, could uh, very easily get all the data with an extremely simple script. Just you know, start at post ID of zero and count up, and uh, there, there you go, you've got it all. Um, so this, I mean, was potentially sort of highly embarrassing for people who you know, didn't want those posts there to be shared around, although you, you should know it at this point that if you post it on the internet, it's out there forever. Um, but it was very easy for people to download all of the stuff that uh, maybe some people didn't want to see. Uh, and that's not a great plan. But even if you don't really care about sort of that information getting, um, getting out there, um, there is a bit of a concern that if others scrape all of your content, they're getting it for free for their benefit. Uh, and you know, there's a cost to you uh, to serve that content, to respond to those requests uh, that somebody else is benefiting from. Um, even if incentive is like non-malicious training for some machine learning model, right? Um, how much did you know, other sites uh, contribute to chat GPT? Answer is quite a lot apparently, right? Like OpenAI used uh, a bunch of publicly available website data uh, to feed into uh, training chat GPT, uh, which now you know, they sell access to. Uh, this is not to say that OpenAI did no work here and you know they're just like purely benefiting from work other people did. That's not true either. But nevertheless, right, lots of that publicly available content I don't think was written with the you know, ex explicit intention of you know, somebody else should be using this to train their AI. Uh, and maybe you care, maybe you don't want that. OpenAI did scan sort of the internet to, to train uh, ChatGPT. I don't think it was invasive as you know, people were pulling data out of Parler, um, but um, it is an interesting discussion, right? Um, is it fair or reasonable for OpenAI to you know, scrape all of that data from websites um, that, again, it takes some cost for you to serve as your uh, host for it, to use it to train their model, which they are then going to monetize? That's kind of an interesting like AI ethics question. Um, and I don't, I don't have the answer to that um, because you know, ethics around AI is, is a very big topic. Um, and it's something that I expect you will sort of have to, have to deal with uh, in your professional careers uh, as AI becomes more popular, as you know, assistive tools come in and as you know, certain job functions are, are replaced with AI, there's gonna be ethical questions about you know, what, is, what is sensible to do and you know, what can we do and what should we do uh, in, in these circumstances. And a lot of these things are not like, strictly speaking, entirely new problems in that sense. Right, um, there were questions, you know, in the past, and you know, I mean, like 30, 40 years ago, about you know, what are the ethics of like having um, machines do jobs that were previously done by people, um, because there there were, and to some extent, still are legitimate questions around the idea of like, should an algorithm determine whether you get a loan, right? Um, there's there's arguments for and against, uh, and the ethical issues of this are, are I would say, not completely solved. But these things are going to happen uh, also for ethics around AI. Uh, and that's not weird. That's just part of advancing technology. And every new technology, to some extent, has this, uh, this debate. Uh, and eventually, you know, we, we usually uh, settle on, on some things, uh, even if the debate may not be totally resolved forever. Anyway, you'll have to wrestle with that in your careers. We don't have time to get into it too much uh, right now in this course, but it is something to think about. Okay, moving on. Let's say that we have a system with a rate limit and this is something that we need to address. Okay, I'm also gonna say that um, the rate limit is actually like a real problem that needs contending with and not just like a hypothetical of like, yeah, eventually maybe we might have to think about it. Because if the rate limit is super high compared to usage, there's no problem, right? You can do a thousand requests per hour and you're sending in 10. Um, what is, there to, what is there to talk about at this point? Um, 
there's potential for a problem in the future that like yes you know if, um, in a couple of years we have a hundred times as many customers then you might start to think about it but that's the sort of problem that you know is best handled by future you right let's let's not worry about it right now um, but if we're hitting the rate limit regularly potentially frustrating for like normal workflows that we want to run um, but also um, overrunning the rate limits a lot could potentially get us banned as a customer from that other service uh, if they think that our usage is abusive rather than just you know, high so we don't want to run up against rate limits if we can help it uh, not only because it's frustrating but again because uh, we might be antagonizing uh, our partner system in this okay so if we start seeing requests that are rejected with an error that says the rate limit exceeded, um, then we know it's a problem, but what is the limit? We don't always know. So in some scenarios, the documentation tells you the limit, right? You go, you look it up on the website and it says, you, know, you are allowed to make three requests per second to this service. Uh, anything above that limit will be rejected. Great, the documentation tells us that. We're, um, we know what to do. Other circumstances, we don't know. Um, and sometimes API uh, exists to query it where you can ask, you know, what is my currently available rate limit? You know, ironic that you have to use some rate limit to find out about what the rate limit is, but whatever, like it, you know, it is a thing. Um, sometimes it comes in the responses, sometimes it's added as a header uh, in some of the responses and you just sort of will, will need to um, look for it and, and use that. Um, but in some cases, it doesn't appear at all. So, that prompts the question, well, if a limit exists, why wouldn't you tell us what it is? Well, here's, um, here's something um, for uh, Atlassian. Uh, they make Jira, if, if you're familiar with that. Um, and I was curious about it, uh, and their argument is based on the idea that they don't want to commit to anything. It's not the only reason. Sometimes they think it might be exploited if you try to use that uh, or that it might encourage bad behavior if they told you sort of the exact number. Um, but sometimes it's just they don't want to commit to anything. And Jira's documentation says REST API rate limits are not published because the computation logic is evolving continuously to maximize reliability and performance for customers. Uh, all right, that, that statement feels uncomfortable to read out loud. Um, because you know, it's so incredibly corporate that I, I just don't know what to do with it. Um, but suffice to say what they mean is they don't want to commit to anything because now they can just change it whenever they want and they don't have to tell you and you know, if their logic does change and it makes it slower or whatever, well, listen, you know, it made it slower, deal with it. It does give them more freedom, right? Um, uh, someone might be mad if those numbers aren't met and now they can make arbitrary changes, sort of whether it, it's good or bad for performance and it's, uh, they're not breaking any promise that they've made to, to anybody. Um, testing for the limit, which is basically spam until we get a rejection uh, might work, but it also might get you banned and given the above, um, the information that we get is probably sort of out of date, um, very quickly at least anyway. Um, so. This section would be very short indeed um, if I said there was nothing we could do. You know, we give up, the right answer is there's nothing. Um, and I was conducting a system design interview for a candidate, uh, this is early in, in 2022, uh, and I presented a scenario with a rate limit. Um, we, we built up a system, you know, it involves calling a third party thing, and we said, okay, now what if we're getting rate limited by that, um, by that third party, what can we do about that? Uh, and the candidate sat with it for a second and he said, you know, I don't think there's anything we can do. That's defeatist, I would say, um, and, and also false, uh, as evidenced by the remainder of this lecture. You know, lecture doesn't end here, you know, that's it, go home, the end. Um, but like, I just don't like the, the idea of like, well, well, there's nothing we can do, let's, let's just give up. That, that feels bad, right? Um, there's, there's always something that we could think of, um, or I would at least like sort of a, a more more thoughtful explanation about why something won't work as opposed to just like we give up. Um, as you may imagine, we did not make an offer to that candidate. Um, one or more of the things below would have been a much better answer. Had they come up with any of these things, um, then that would have been better. I can't say that was make or break on whether we hired them, um, but nevertheless, uh, it would have been would have been a better answer to that question. 
So right off the top, the immediate thought is do less work, right? Can we do less work? That is, we should simply reduce the number of our API calls. That might help, but we might not find a lot of redundancy, right? If the service is pay per request, like you know, every time we request something from the service, we, we pay a small amount, um, then doing this saves money. Um, so, you know, that's good. Um, I do not imagine though that we are like intentionally calling a third party service more than we need, but it's possible there's some redundant calls that you could find if you actually did sort of a thorough review of all the workflows and you could say, actually we could you know, avoid this because we don't need it um, or you know, we already have the information that we're looking for. So requesting it a second time is redundant. Like that kind of thing could happen, right? Uh, if you do find redundancy, excellent, great, get rid of it. Um, you have uh, avoided some rate limit issues. Uh, you also reduce latency in your application by avoiding some network calls. Um, but also I'm realistically going to say probably there isn't a great deal of redundancy in this. Um, so the, the actual benefit that we could find is, is fairly small. Caching is the second option that we want to discuss. Um, and again, we've talked about caching, so nothing super new here. Um, and an easy way to reduce the number of calls to a remote system is to remember the answers that we've previously received. Um, we don't really have to go into a, a lot of detail about caching because we've already discussed right through and right back caches and, and that sort of thing. It is possible if you want uh, to make caching invisible from the point of view of the calling system, uh, you could use something like Redis, which uh, is sort of um, sits outside the service and can handle requests and responses. So we uh, don't end up needing quite as much um, network traffic in that regard. But if we don't control the remote system, it may be more difficult to identify when a particular piece of data has changed and a fresh response is needed rather than the other one. Um, to, to put it uh, in this, uh, in, in terms of we've talked about before, like, you know, if we're looking for an invalidate to come in saying, you know, hey, I want you to know this thing has changed, that functionality may not exist, right? We might be able to sign up for a webhook for it, or we might, um, you know, we're the only ones who would ever change this, so we would know it. But sometimes there are other things that are going to change uh, some data element, and we would only know that if we asked again. In other cases, though, domain knowledge is perfectly valid. Uh, as a way of solving this problem. Um, let's talk about exchange rates because it's a subject I know something about. Um, I'm going to Frankfurt and you know, I need to buy Euro with my Canadian dollars and exchange rates are basically just a price. Uh, someone says I'm willing to you know, buy uh, you know, Euro for this and sell Canadian dollars for that. But let's say uh, at the time I wrote the, the lectures, uh, 100 Euro translated roughly to 143 Canadian dollars. Exchange rates vary throughout the day, uh, at least sort of on business days. Um, and they may not change on weekends or holidays or something like that, but let's, let's imagine that they change throughout the day. But usually when you are given a quote, um, you, you get a certain validity period with it. So the validity period might be, just for the sake of example, 20 minutes. That is to say that this is the rate that somebody has quoted you, uh, and if you accept the offer within that window, that rate will be honored. Like they they will stick to that price. Now, that might actually be you know good or bad depending on how the exchange rates move during that time. Um, but we have a, a valid quotation uh, for 20 minutes, and we can use it during the validity period without needing to query it again. So even if multiple people say are interested in you know, trading dollars for euro, uh, during the time in which this, uh, this quotation is valid, we don't have to query again, we can just use that value. All right, not everything is gonna be that easy, not everything comes with you know, a, a validity guarantee. Next strategy to consider is whether we can group up uh, requests into one larger request. So instead of like one super big, uh, super big request, right? Like you know, splitting it might be simpler, but the remote API has to allow it. Um, if, if we can only like request sort of uh, one small data element at a time, we can't group things up. Well, there's not a lot we can do. Um, but many APIs have uh, you know, capacity for mass update. That you could you know, update five customers or you know, a list of customers in one shot. Uh, and doing so uh, is more efficient in the sense of you know, there's only one call to update a larger number of customers as opposed to needing one call for each individual customers. Now, there do have to be things to group up with because if there's nothing to group the request with, then you know, that 
feels silly, so there's nothing we can do about it. Um, and um, the API supporting it could, could kind of be interesting. Um, we don't know necessarily what the API will allow. In some cases, you can request related things. So like I say, updating five employees in, in one request, that might work. Um, but in other cases, the API will allow you to update arbitrary number of things. Um, you can just, you know, in, in one call, update you know, some customer and you know, some order and some invoice, uh, and they all go together and you don't actually have to send those in as individual requests. Whether that's good or bad as like API design is a separate discussion, um, but it's, uh, there, there's no obvious answer to these sorts of things. Now, if we have uh, requests ready to go, um, we can in fact, uh, if, if we want, uh, just group them up and, and send them out. Um, if, if there's a lot of users who are sort of doing the same thing at the same time, grouping it up might kind of work. Um, in other cases, that's probably sort of not, not beneficial. Um, we're thinking about you know, for editing a user, we expect those changes to be reflected immediately and it's kind of frustrating if they're not. So we have to be careful about sort of what is synchronous versus asynchronous uh, in this request. And uh, grouping requests can also overlap with caching. Um, if you use uh, write back style cache or another strategy that allows multiple modifications before the eventual call to updating the remote system. But grouping requests also can make it harder to like build your request uh, and parse the response. Um, if we are asked to update five employees and one of the requests is invalid, uh, is that the whole group of changes is rejected or is it only the one that had an error? That again depends on the API. Uh, and because you know, composing a bigger request involves more logic and you know, if-else cases and you know, checking that the, the validation and what have you is, is correct uh, is more difficult, there is more chance that something goes wrong, right? The more complex the request that we're building, the harder it is to validate that it is actually correct. So uh, the same also applies for uh, parsing the response. If we misunderstand the response, um, then it could easily cause inconsistent data or um, you know, repeated requests. So this sort of strategy, um, along with a lot of other things that we talk about in this course just generally, uh, involve adding a fair amount of implementation complexity in exchange for improved performance. Uh, and this isn't something we should do lightly, right? We should do this only if we have to, uh, particularly because a simpler implementation is most likely much easier to maintain, um, but also kind of easier to debug and to, to deal with. Another strategy, one that I am in fact terrible at, personally speaking, is patience. Uh, and if the problem is that too many requests are happening in a short period of time, then uh, what do we do but distribute the requests over more period of time? I'm going to imagine, you know, time travel hasn't been invented yet at the time you're watching this. We're not traveling at like relativistic speeds or anything weird like that. Um, so the only way that there could actually be more time is to wait. That does mean delaying requests uh, to stay under the rate limit. And that can feel certainly like the opposite of what we want if we want it to go faster. But if rate limit responses are coming in, those requests are not happening anyway. So you could make an argument that delayed is better than denied. Outside of the computer context, when there's more demand for something capacity, you know, what do we do? Well, we queue or line up for it. In this case, uh, it means that requests should be added to a queue uh, and a request gets processed when it gets to the front of the queue. Uh, and by simply controlling the rate at which requests leave the queue, that's sufficient to ensure that the rate limit on the other side is not exceeded, right? Um, as long as all requests um, go through this queue, there's a central place to adjust that setting if we need. Doesn't sound too bad. Unsurprisingly, there are multiple Rust crates that do what you want. I did a little search and of course I came across many options because this is uh, not a particularly uh, uncommon thing to ask for. Um, but below are some documentation examples from the rate limit crate that I, I came across. This is uh, version 0.7.1 uh, and none of these things are fancy, let's be honest. Um, we certainly could have considered other ones, but listen, I, I just want to give a little bit of insight into it. Um, and the documentation covers some implementation details that are worth talking about. So let's take a look. 
So if we want to create a rate limiter, um, we have actually several options that are kind of interesting to talk about. So the first one here is a rate limiter that generates one token per second with no burst. So we just produce a steady rate of requests and it starts with uh, no tokens available, which means that uh, across an application restart, you cannot, concede the configure, uh, it cannot exceed the configure rate limit. So that one's pretty good. Um, in another use case, we're looking at sort of admission control, uh, and that is we have an initial budget and we just replenish it periodically. So the rate limiter allows a thousand tokens per hour. Um, and for every hour long sliding window, no more than a thousand tokens can be required, um, but all tokens can be used in a single burst. Okay, um, and that's also sort of a fairly popular uh, implementation. Another idea um, is um, instead of sort of spreading it out, uh, so instead of concentrating it, we're going to spread it out. Um, so instead of just uh, looking at a thousand per hour, um, what we'll do is we'll have uh, multiple tokens per interval. Uh, and this one uh, that we see here uh, allows 50 million tokens per second, but no more than 50 in any one microsecond. So we end up with like a little bit of a distribution. Um, this is still obviously a very fast rate uh, at which we can send requests, um, but we're making sure we're not sending too many uh, in a, a very, very short window. Uh, and then finally, uh, last one, a rate limiter that uh, generates 100 tokens per second with no burst, also very simple. Uh, and what we would do is also not super complicated given a particular rate limiter. Um, what we will do is try wait. Uh, and if we are successful, then um, we are allowed to continue. Um, otherwise, sleep for you know, some period of time uh, and do the next iteration of the loop. Uh, once, we, once we break out of this, then uh, we will sort of finish the, uh, finish the waiting and then we can take our rate limited action. Now, in queuing a request is not always suitable if the user is sitting at the screen and awaiting a response to the request because what we're doing is taking a synchronous uh, workflow and we're making it asynchronous. That works in some scenarios, but not all of them, right? Rearchitecting things to be um, uh, an asynchronous flow is kind of uh, a long-term goal for any uh, existing application and it might not be that easy to do for every workflow, but there are probably some that we can do. Um, any request that doesn't have to be synchronous, we could move to asynchronous. We're never probably going to get 100% of the way there because there are inevitably some things that are going to be synchronous, like you know, users logging on. This, this is a synchronous operation. The user is sitting there and waiting for it. And you can't really just say, yeah, you know, eventually you'll get logged in. That's, that's probably going to be a bad user experience. Um, but anything that isn't urgent, we could delay. We could make it asynchronous. Um, and for requests that are not urgent, we could try to schedule them for a less busy time. Um, and this is, um, this is not always easy, but most applications have a usage pattern of some sort um, and they have busier and, and less busy times. So if you know your application is not used very much overnight, let's say, that's a great time to do things that count against your rate limits that can wait. They don't have to be right now. So why not put them off and do them at a, a time that isn't so busy? Thinking of an earlier example, you know, imagine you have a billing system where monthly invoicing procedure uses the majority of the rate limit. If that happens during the day, then you can end up in a situation where there isn't any available capacity for things like creating a new customer or you know, updating them or paying an invoice or something like that. So that doesn't feel nice. You know, you submitted your payment and it doesn't show up as paid yet because you know, there's a thousand invoices ahead of you in the queue to be issued, right? Um, what do we do? I'll just run the invoicing procedure overnight, right? Most people aren't using the system at nighttime. Um, maybe not zero, but certainly much closer to zero than you know, at noon uh, during the day. So why not? Um, Another possible solution, incidentally, uh, is maybe you can even convince management to uh, not make it so all users are billed on the first day of the month. By distributing them out over the, the month, then you necessarily uh, can spread out the pain a little bit and not have such a big peak uh, on, on any one day. Um, doing so, however, may require a little bit of charisma because you, know, you are trying to persuade some people. 
Um, and uh, that actually kind of leads us to that whole you know, role persuasion kind of idea, um, which is uh, if we're being limited by the other side, um, can we convince the other side to raise the limit? In the words of Matt Mercer, you can certainly try. How does this work? I mean, sometimes it's negotiated. Sometimes you, you know, call or email them and you say, listen, we're getting rate limited here and we'd like to increase it. And you know, they say, all right, you, know, you guys seem nice, we'll allow it. Um, and sometimes that's not, not that easy. Um, sometimes it just means upgrading to a higher billing tier. You know, then, okay, you know, so we have to pay more money per month and for that we get you know, a higher service level and we're happy with that. Um, you might be a sufficiently important customer that you can negotiate it. Um, but sometimes you just can't, right? You know, if you're being rate limited by Google or something, you know, there's probably no option for you to just call Google and say, hey, we'd like a higher rate limit. Um, paying more money though is a perfectly legitimate solution. Um, throwing money at it can work. Um, it may be expensive, but remember also that you know, engineering time is also expensive. So you would need to do a bit of an analysis of, you know, is it worth your while to pay more money to upgrade this? Uh, service level or you know, pay people to work on the problem using one of the other strategies that we've talked about. Okay, so the last thing to close out sort of this topic is the idea of, well, what happens if it happens anyway? We might still encounter the occasional rate limit and it's not bad as long as we acknowledge that this could happen and we have a strategy for how to recover. So. The right way obviously is not try harder or try more. Um, if we are being rate limited, the correct answer is try again later, but how much later? So sometimes the answer for how long to wait is in the API response. Sometimes they actually like really put in the headers or, or somewhere where they say, okay, you, know, you can try again after this time or you know, wait X more seconds before retrying. Uh, and that actually is perfectly acceptable. That is allowed. You have to look for it. You have to know that it's there. But if it is there, then by all means, take advantage of it. Sometimes it's not though. Um, and sometimes we might want to do something where we're going to you know, use an exponential back off strategy. And the strategy there is to wait some period of time and try again. And if the error occurs, then um, wait longer than last time and repeat this procedure until we have succeeded. Um, and exponential back off is also sort of applicable to um, situations where um, a request is unsuccessful but not due to rate limiting. If the resource is not available for you know, some maintenance related reason, let's say, it could be quite a while before it's back. Uh, and therefore just continually spamming the request to uh, uh, load the page or something isn't helpful. Uh, it's, it's not solving anything uh, and we're just wasting time. If the resource is overloaded, then you know, the reaction of requesting more um, actually makes the problem worse. Uh, and the more failures have occurred, so the longer the wait. Uh, so we don't want that. Right? What we actually want is to back off, uh, you know, try again later, uh, and you know, every time we get a, another rejection, increase the time that we're waiting, um, such that the service gets a chance to recover. Eventually, though, you may conclude that there's sort of no point in further retries, so you know, the back off may, may run and it'll try uh, a total of 10 times, and if we're still not successful after that, then we you know, give up and you know, tell the user, sorry, we were not able to complete your request. Um, that's okay, right? There, there does exist a point at which we could say you know, exponential back off um, reaches, reaches a maximum. Um, if um, you took a look at uh, the Appendix C, which talked about, um, uh, talked about Crossbeam, uh, one of the crates that, that may be useful to you in completing some of the course assignments or um, practice exercises or in-class in activities, um, there exists uh, a strategy that has an implementation in there for exponential back off. Um, and having read the source code, at least at the time when I looked at it, uh, it didn't seem to have any jitter in, in the request. Um, and I would describe Jitter as being very useful um, because it prevents all threads or callers from retrying at the exact same time. 
Um, and jitter adds just a little bit of sort of random noise to uh, the time at which you retry. So in the wait, you're just adding like a little tiny slice of time just so if two threads try to access a resource at the same time uh, and they, they have to retry, it doesn't end up with uh, you know, both of them retrying after the exact same amount of time. I'll explain with kind of an example. Um, I, I once wrote a program that uh, tried synchronizing its threads via the database. Uh, we we're trying to process items that were in the database and would try to uh, select a row from that database. And if they were not successful, um, then they would back off and retry. Um, makes sense so far, um, except um, the initial implementation I wrote that had exponential back off did not have jitter. So I would get a lot of warnings in the log about failing to lock and it would retry. Right? The, the warnings were just like info, really. Uh, it's not a problem. It's just you know for my own purposes and understanding how well the solution was working. Um, and I realized it was because, well, listen, if there's eight threads and you know, each of them tries to lock this uh, element sort of all at the same time, there is a potential um, that you know, one thread is successful, seven threads retry, and if they all retry at the same time, then one thread will succeed and another six will be unsuccessful, and so on and so on. So what we don't want is that same thing. Um, what we want is a little bit of randomness added to this. So if one thread retries at x plus five, and another at x plus seven, and another at x plus eight, um, then this sort of thing results in no conflicts, or at least fewer conflicts, because the different threads retrying at different times will each pick up an item fairly efficiently without having to retry quite as many times. The exponential back off with jitter strategy is very good for a scenario where we have a lot of independent clients sort of accessing the same resource. Um, but if we have one client that's accessing the resource lots of times, then we probably want something like TCP congestion control. Uh, if you took a networking course, you may have talked about that or something similar to it. Uh, it is beyond the scope of the course, so we're not really going to spend a lot of time talking about TCP congestion control. In fact, I'm not going to talk about it at all. Uh, but there is a link uh, in the lecture notes that uh, gives you some more details uh, if you're interested in reading a little bit about uh, how TCP congestion control actually works. Anyway, all this is to say that you know, if we are being rate limited uh, by some, some other service, like it's not the end of the world. There are things we can do and there are ways that we can maximize our performance, recognizing that like the ultimate cap on uh, our performance is going to be uh, whatever we can do with that third party service. Um, but you know, we make the most of the capacity that we have, hopefully.